on. Uh, Razib is a geneticist uh, as well as a prolific online personality. He's got a really popular um, genetics and history blog that focuses a lot on history and evolution. Uh, and he also uh, hosts several of his own podcasts as well. Razib, welcome to the show. Hey, nice to be on. Thanks for, thanks for coming on. Uh, I'm really excited to finally be able to talk to you just because we've known each other for actually uh, quite a while, uh, at least on Twitter. We've been following each other for a while. So um, I'm just really, really excited to you know, be talking sort of like an OG in terms of um, producing online content. You've been out here for, uh, for quite a while um, you know, doing stuff. So that's a real big inspiration to us just getting started. Um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> OG is funny, but it's true. <laughs> <laughs> it is. It is. Yeah. Uh, I'm sure, you know, for you, you're sort of just like not really thinking of yourself in those terms, but that's how I think of it. Um, anyway, um, so I'm really happy to have you on. Um, we, you're actually, uh, one of the, you may be the first, uh, person from the hard sciences that we've actually uh, had on our show, uh, from the natural sciences, at least. Shame on you, uh, bro. Yeah, it's, it's a real problem. You know, we've been having all these social science people and humanities people and, you know, it's just absolute, uh, uh nothing but mayhem over here in terms of our intellectual, uh, rigor. <laughs> I kid, I kid. Um, but anyway, so I'm really, really excited to, um, sort of just get your take on, um, a number of different issues. I have some questions about, demographic shifts and, um, and population genetics. But before we get into that, do you want to just describe to the audience a little bit about what your kind of research and interests tend to center around outside of your, you know, daily professional work? Mm, well, I mean, I mean, so basically, um, you know, as you said, like I, I work at a lot, um, I write a lot at the intersection of evolution and population genetics and history. Um, mm -hmm. I'm obviously really interested in history. I read a lot of history books and I read a lot of genetics papers. And so that's what kind of bubbles up. But I am interested in other topics such as phylogenetic inference and conventional population genetics, looking at signatures of selection, um, just standard stuff. Um, you know, I take an interest in prenatal genomics, in medical genomics, um, professionally and personally. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, I'm all over the place and uh, I try to keep my hand in in terms of like technical things so you know like i can program in python i write my own pipelines you know it's um i have you know consulting business that i do so uh that you don't really see um that's not surfaced to the public mm. facing but um that is part of who i am it's just you know not relevant to the general public um in terms of the books i read and the questions and issues that i'm interested in i think that's all pretty public mostly although um you know there's certain things that you probably don't know about it I, yeah um, of course there's um there's like some movies that I liked and sometimes I would put a note about a movie and my readers would be like well I've been reading it for 10 years and I would never guess that and the yeah. point um that I'm bringing that up is just that uh I'm not like a reality television person I don't talk about everything about my personal life or preferences you know and so mm -hmm. uh, sometimes it annoys me when people over generalize and assume that they know me and uh, they know the parts of me that are relevant to be out there um, that I think are useful to the public discussion or, um, you know, that I'm interested in finding people that are passionate about the same topics. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, obviously, you know, you're, you're going to be, every human is very multifaceted and, you know, the parts of them that you see uh, that make their way to the internet are only a small slice of, um, who they are and um we don't expect uh, everybody to fully expose themselves online because they wouldn't survive um well but i mean you know in this in 2020 um you know there are these influencers and instagram people these lifestyle mm -hmm. people and so i mean they are like that and i think sometimes that get, gets like kind of like mushed together in people's perceptions and that's why i'm bringing that up yeah actually i i mean as somebody that myself is trying to become i guess kind of an influencer or at least i'm trying to have uh, my own online platform that could eventually replace my my um, you know my my normal income um, n like issues of like okay well how much is oversharing how much of this do I want to keep private you know I had to make the decision a while back on whether or not I wanted to keep my uh, uh, my Twitter account like pseudonymous um, and um, I even at one point considered starting over and just creating a fully anonymous personality um but well so we, we we talked about this but your listeners might be interested to know that sure. there's someone else i interact with who has the exact same avatar as you 
Yes. And so um, for a long time, I, think I would Rory get Witt is his name. Huh? I think he goes by Rory Witt on Twitter. No, no, no. This is a different person. It's an Indian guy. Oh, okay. And so he would talk about Hindu nationalism, and then you would mm. talk about what you – and I would just get really confused <laughs> periodically. I thought you had – I thought you were an individual that had extremely striking bimodal interests, <laughs> you know? Yeah, um, like I'm just some weird American that's like really obsessed with Hindu nationalist politics. Yes, yes. And so um, – you know, it, that goes to the point of like, you know, how you create your identity. And, you know, I'm, I'm verified on Twitter. And the main reason I did that many years ago is because I didn't want someone impersonating me online, which has right. happened. And that, isn't that the only way to get verified is if someone else is impersonating you? No, I mean, there's other ways. After 2017, they clamped down. So you have to have a media hookup or be famous. OK. All right. But I mean, you have to have a reason where it's like you're a public person. And so you want to own that brand. And that's that's what I explained. It was pretty easy. I think I got it at the end of 2016. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, that, that's, that's that's pretty cool. Do you think your check mark, uh, check mark like helps you? Does it make you more authoritative? I don't know. Um, you know, people make fun of me about it. Um, well, yeah, you know, you're going to get ripped down by the non check marks. No matter yeah. What. So, I mean, that's I find that amusing. Um, the main positive thing about it is. I think there's a higher threshold for like reporting and banning and doing all sorts of things to me, you know, mm -hmm. um, I'm not just like random person. So, I mean, that's positive. I don't think it affects it too much, but I kind of take it for granted at this point. I've had it for a long enough time that it's like, yeah, you wouldn't even know what it was like without it. I don't remember too well. And also it wasn't as big of a deal that the Twitter has changed a lot in the last 10 years. It's become much more stratified and you know, you've, you've been on, you've seen it. Yeah. So is that uh, is that locking the comments feature? Is that a feature that you can only do if you have a uh, if you have a verified account, or is that just like a thing that they're rolling out in some places and not others? Do you know? Um, yeah, I don't know for sure. I assume it was blue checkmark. I've never used it, but um, yeah, me neither. Uh, I think I think where it would be useful would be if you're getting mobbed by enemies, kind of, you know. Well, what I've been seeing is like whoever these accounts are that can do it. I don't know why they can do it or how that gets sorted out. And I could probably just look it up. But um, it's almost like if you have access to that feature, you can just start making like what I've noticed is that the, the people that are using it are making posts that they know are going to be controversial. And so they just, you know, they just turn that on because they just don't mm -hmm. want anybody who's from the other side that's coming fair. into their lives. Well, I mean, that's. That's just like, um, you know, you can put up a post without comments on a blog, mm -hmm. you know, and that, that was one reason sometimes people would do that sort of thing. For some reason, the audio cut out here, but I asked Razeev about his blog, GNXP.com, and for how long he's been blogging for. Okay, back to the show. Um, continuously since April of 2002. Wow, and uh, actually about... the last week, the last week of March of two thousand two. Huh. And so, um, about how frequently are you? Do you update your blog? How, how what's your post schedule like? Uh, probably once every day or so. Back in the early years, when there was no Twitter, we would post like six to twelve things a day because we had a group blog. Um, but yeah, probably on average once a day now. But um, I've gone as long as. Well, my site was down for a couple of months, one of my sites, and so that was a long time. I don't usually go more than two weeks, though, but usually okay. it's like once a day on average. Sometimes I'll do twice a day. Um, I have a job. I have three kids. Right. You know, I, I have stuff going on that I didn't when I was in 2002. <laughs> okay, yeah, when it was hyperblog. Uh, yeah, I was just wondering on that because, you know, the posts that you you put out are, you know, I mean, they're not the longest posts ever, but they're relatively in-depth, so I'm actually surprised that you're able to – produce them at that high of a rate at this quality well so i've how many i think um i don't know like i have like 20 million words on my blog wow i'm a pretty fast writer um i'm definitely yeah. a faster writer than i was back then and also if you know a lot um in your topic it's not that difficult so um you know when i took the uh the gre i definitely got like um you know the the highest score on the writing part <laughs> Mm -hmm. I did okay elsewhere, but I'm just saying that um, I'm a pretty good writer now, partly because of the blog, even though it's idiosyncratic, you know, because uh, sometimes when I write for non-blog things, when I write for, I don't know, just like National Review or City Journal or something, people are like, oh, that writing is very different. I'm like, well, yeah, because with a blog, just me. You have I'm a different a, audience. Yeah. 
and I, with a blog, I don't really care if people don't get all the technical terms. Like, I don't care then. I mean, like, you can look it up or not. I don't care. Well, also, it's like your blog, so everyone who's there is, should know what's up, right? Yeah, yeah. And I, I really miss the, uh, I mean, I, I guess I'm old now. I have some nostalgia for the blogosphere in those days where people were just much more open-minded. And yeah, there was some smart snark, but man, like we used to be like, you know, say like, oh, like these people are just like rude and unpleasant and all that. And then like Twitter came along and it's just like, whoa, okay, never mind. You know, it just took it to next level. Like this is, um, like, blogs were kind of like freshman year bull sessions mm -hmm. and Twitter is like eighth grade. <laughs> Interesting, interesting. Yeah, I mean, I was never around during like the zenith of blogging, um, but as I understand it, there was a period where you could make some pretty good money and um, have some pretty sizable traffic as well running an independent mm -hmm. blog. So, and I think well, we there's still I mean, some that do that, but yeah, I mean, I have like I probably have like it depends because I was on Discover and other things for a while. You know, I've been on several different platforms and. I don't really anticipate doing that in the near future because I, I think I want to control my own means of production, so to speak. Mm -hmm. um, but, uh, you know, I still get like thousands of readers a day, you know? Yeah. So uh, you said that uh, one of your interests is um, like prenatal genetics. And as far I think I remember uh, you've sequenced your children's genomes. Is that correct? Yeah. My son, um, my first son is the first um, MIT Tech Review has an article about it. Mm -hmm. uh, in 2014, he's the first um, confirmed healthy child born who was sequenced before he was born. Oh, yeah, yeah, that was it, right? So, um, the history of the world. Okay, so I, I have many questions about that, but I'll start with w one of the first ones, which is uh, what is the benefit to sequencing your child's genome um, that young? Uh, are you screening for different kinds of heritable diseases? Uh, is there other information that's relevant? What did you get out of that? Yeah, I mean, so basically, um, when you do a sequence, it's everything, it's all the information. So everything that you know that you could get a genotype for, you get. So yes, by definition, you are screening. Um, we didn't find anything that was a problem. So it's all good, right? And there's nothing actionable. The only okay. things actionable are negative, you know? So like, if you see like some major chromosomal abnormalities, okay. Just like those Down syndrome, you know, screening tests, stuff like mm -hmm. that. Um, and we, we knew certain things about his physical characteristics ahead of time. So, because um, I can do the analysis myself, I'm a geneticist. Oh, right. Uh, so you so can like that, that, piece it together. Oh, yeah, yeah. I don't like, I don't need anyone's help. Like, people need, you know what I'm saying? Like, I don't need anyone's help to do that. Like, I, I can analyze the raw data and do the inferences and everything mm -hmm. myself. Um, mm -hmm. So, we had it all ahead of time. Um, and, you know, like, I mean, just like trivial things, like, okay, like, what is his, uh, you have dry earwax, wet earwax, or, you know, I predicted aspects of his complexion and pigmentation ahead of time and compared it to my daughter. They were actually valid predictions. So, um, when he was like four months, you know, in utero. Yeah. Right. Wow. So, so in terms of the, the predictive power of having just the, just the raw code available, um, are there, so there are obviously like more complex traits uh, like polygenic traits, things like, you know, and, and other things that are influenced by the environment as they grow up. Um, it, are, are there going to be more, I, I guess what I'm trying to ask is like, are there going to be more things that we can find out with just the genome uh, in the future? Or is what we know right now, basically everything that we're going to know until we do, you know, have more complex understanding of, you know, gene interactions? Yeah, I mean, we'll know more. Um, it's going to get better. It might not, I mean, depending on the trade, it's not going to get like many fold better. It might get like 50% better. You know, maybe mm -hmm. it's like 50% of the more variants. So, you know, with the polygenic traits, there is the automatic, um, just technical limitations to polygenic, right? Mm -hmm. um, they're not like monogenic predictions, which have high penetrance, et cetera, et cetera. So the science will put a limiter on that. It's going to get better. It's going to get noticeably better. Um, as far as gene interactions, I mean, I think that's more of a 2030s thing. Um, we're going to figure out um, independent genetic effects more in the 2020s. Uh, and, uh, you know, there's going to be, if you if 10% of people find something that's super important, that's going to be a lot, even if it's going to be a minority, right? And so mm. if everyone does the screening, that's going to be millions of people. So right. I think you need to, like, figure it's a glass, glass half full, half empty. 
um, you know, most, you don't want most people to get actionable results because those are not good usually, you know? So, so hopefully most, most people won't. There's a fear then about what people would do if they found something, you know, they, they don't like. Yeah. I mean, you know, eugenic social engineering or you know about all of those things are there um mm. I, I don't i'm not anticipating people like selecting too much for polygenic traits right now at least in the next 10 years it's going to be mostly about like you know mutations and other things like that but that's not trivial yeah you know? but i guess like we just keep hearing these things about like oh well they're going to start like selecting for height or intelligence or something like that and that just seems like so far away um you yeah, know, they try I mean, to do that with like sperm banks, but you know, there's things you can do. It's not like totally impossible, but it seems like there's easier ways to get that, mm -hmm. right? Does that make sense? Like, I mean, find a mate yeah. that's smart or tall. So when you did the sequence, uh, obviously you did it yourself. Um, but is there like special equipment that's required to do that, or do you just need to have the um, or like I guess like how do I how do I get how do I get the code, right? You you get a piece of the DNA and then you what you um... yeah the, yeah the, it's not the technical aspect isn't turnkey right now. Okay. Um, so one, it's hard to amplify genomic material in utero. There's not that much. Um, the protocols are not. So I was working in a genetics laboratory at the time and we just did it internally, you know, mm -hmm. and it wasn't a problem. Uh, and also I got the amplified amplified DNA from the lab that I had outsourced some things to. And so it, it was a whole production. It did require someone that had a lot of connections like me and that had the skills. Um, and then we got the raw reads back and then I assembled the raw reads. That's not trivial, although it's not like that hard. And then I reduced the raw reads down to the sequence. And then once you have a sequence, it's, you know, you just look at it, right? And you yeah. run the statistical programs or you look at their states. I think in the future, it's going to get to a stage where there'll be enough people that do it that'll be automated, um, the tissue or the, you know, extracting uh, fetal DNA from the mother's blood. Um, there's already work in this area on how to do it in the best way and to get it to scale. And the data analysis and processing will be turnkey. Like you will never... You know, you, the end user, will never see the raw data. You'll just see the top results. If you want the raw data, I'm sure they'll be able to, you know, just send it to you. Um, although the raw sequence data is quite large. There's three gigs, right? Yeah. Without compression. But um, the informative stuff is way smaller. Because remember, 99% of your genome is just like every other human's, you know? Mm -hmm. So that's just that redundant information. So, I mean, the compression is trivial. Just compress everything that's the reference sequence and just say that it is. Um but uh, yeah, I think I think you imagine a dashboard. You know, you're just gonna dashboard report, mm -hmm. and it'll tell you anything that's interesting. And honestly, for most people, they don't want anything interesting. They just want a normal pregnancy, right? Yeah. So with like the consumer genetics testing, like you know the 23andMe and so forth. Um, my understanding is one when they do those, they're not doing the full sequence because they don't need to to get the information they're getting. Um, you can correct me if that's wrong uh and but but the question i had i had uh for you was as a geneticist are there any like do you do you have any concerns about issues around privacy or the the reselling of that data like like as a as a citizen should i be mm -hmm. hesitant to send off my uh my dna to get tested by one of these agencies um so uh i actually have um if you're curious um, I have a white paper on this topic coming out. So oh, just for my um, uh, for my day job. Um, so should you be concerned? Um, yeah, but the issue is the hospitals have really bad privacy. I'm gonna just throw them under the bus because that's really where the weakness is. These consumer genomics firms, yeah, they might want to resell it, but your value, your data is valuable to them. They're gonna actually be very careful about privacy. Mm -hmm. um, the issue with the hospitals is traditionally hospitals have had really lax security and there's been no consequences. And nobody really owns the privacy, um, you know, just like with a lot of big corporations, system administrators only matter when they make a when they mess up, you know. Yeah. And so it's like it's like being a lineman in the NFL, like they only get their name called when they miss, you know, miss someone and the quarterback gets sacked. So um, there are some serious issues. I think, you know, there's two things we can do. Um, 
this is in the white paper and we're probably going to get an op-ed somewhere like maybe in the wall street journal at some point on it um, the government needs to standardize and update its regulations which are designed from the 1980s and 1990s and even mm -hmm. 2000s they're very narrow they're very out of date like hipaa um, and gene genetic uh, information like the privacy act you know non-discrimination act that's what it was um, and so everything is out of date with big data and the universality and all these issues related to storage okay europe has a gdp gdpr which is just a general data information privacy law so we need something like that the second issue is um technology so things like blockchain crypto encryption people need to be able to control the distribution of their data to who they want to because genetic data is very very useful in the aggregate but it's not you know, it's it's useful when you have a huge ecology information, but people need to have an opt in, a buy in. And so if you had an encryption um, vault and mm -hmm. only you had a key and you could give the key to people that you trusted, that would really help instead of um, asking what's up with my data, where's it stored? Like, you know what I'm saying? Like yeah. Other people could access it or you can give them like a subset of it that's important to them. Um, we just need to be more flexible and clever about the technology. And I think having a broader regulatory framework that is designed for 2020 and not 2008 or 1996, and I'm thinking about when HIPAA and GINA, you know, mm -hmm. kind of came together, um, would really help with that. It's just the United States is kind of disorganized and, you know, you do everything piecemeal and that's just not working in this space. And people are scared. Um, they should be scared because if you get if you get identity theft, um, you can change your social security card. You can't change your DNA. So, but okay. So, so that's 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 actually a good a good point to dig in on a little bit. So, if someone gets a hold of your DNA that it's not supposed to have it, what could they do with that that would be problematic for you? I mean, the easiest thing is if you're a politician, and this is why politicians are very careful. Um, you could, in theory, design a bioweapon to target your specific DNA. That's what I was wondering. Um, like, there's security. But the, but the, I'm not worried about that. My VCS, is, my information's out there. Um, it's going to be much cheaper to hire a Russian or something. <laughs> you know, I yeah. mean, I mean, uh, there are certain cases where you might like be able to design some long acting bio weapon. And so people don't know, but it's going to be so expensive and unwieldy. You got to be a really special person um, for that to be worth their time. Like when it comes to me and you, like, you know, they're just going to poison us or something, you know, yeah, yeah, that's yeah. so much cheaper. Well, like, I, I guess with this, like, maybe the costs coming down sometime in the future could be, I don't know. Um, So uh, I wanted to dig in a little bit more into your interests and how they relate to genetics, because I don't think it's necessarily obvious to someone who's not a geneticist. Um, what where the connection is to, uh, let's say, like history, for example. Um, so you, you're very, very interested in history, judging by the amount of writing you've done and the amount of books you've read, you probably know actually way more history than I do. Um, and I have to assume that your training in genetics and, and your just general knowledge of the field gives you a certain, uh, perspective on history. Is it, is it your perspective on history informed by your work in genetics? Yeah, I mean... I mean, basically, uh, genetics is genealogy, mm -hmm. and genealogy is pedigrees. Um, right. And so, uh, feels like um, feels like genetics and demography actually they come from the same thing. They're just different ways of looking at it. Demography intersects with history, and so um, you know, if you make an assertion that, uh, like, I'll, I'll give you a concrete example. Sure. Um, there was a book that came out in 2012, I forget his name now, it's a German guy, about barbarian invasions. And he basically said the Huns, the Huns were genetic, the Huns were not really some East Asian group. Um, they were like a group of like culturally diverse mercenaries that had long lived on the Roman frontier. Okay. That's, that's making an assertion, and this was actually a common historical assertion. We know that's false now, because we, people have gone to the graves of Huns, they've looked at their genetics, so they're half East Asian. Yeah. They're exactly what Amianus Marcellinus said they were. 
You know, mm-hmm. they were people from the Far East, et cetera, et cetera. So you can test a lot of historical conjectures and assertions that have demographic implications quite easily with genetics. And that was obvious immediately. Um, it's gotten more and more powerful, especially with ancient DNA and the new methods. Um, history can't tell you, or genetics cannot tell you about whether the monothelite controversy in the Eastern Roman Empire was really that big of a deal. Right. But it can't tell you if the Romans were genetically replaced by people from other parts of, you know, from the Eastern Mediterranean, like some people assert. You know, mm-hmm. um, so there's a lot of questions that can be answered having to do with the migrations and the movements of people. And then there's others that, you know, it can like the cultural history. I mean, you know, that's leave that to the archaeologists. But um, the dem- demography is also informative because archaeologists, you know, had a this idea that, oh, well, only cultural forms move. People don't move. That turns out to be totally false. Right. And so um it's eliminating a lot like of people don't yeah. move as in like they don't have migrations or no, basically it. that you learn from your neighboring communities you know hmm. or like or for example um like let's okay let's so, that, so they're basically denying like like population replacements or that makes large-scale sure. invasions it's not or replacement yeah okay so i mean like think about um think about the anglo-saxon invasions there was a hypothesis that it was like a small group of mercenaries that took over romano-british society and eventually their cultural values and language just percolated downward we know mm-hmm. that's false now it looks like to be about like 25 percent of the ancestry in england is german now right. is that a lot or is that a little again it depends on your perspective it's not a replacement mm-hmm. but it's 25 percent. that's a lot especially in a pre-modern environment but um, and it's more the aren't there more aren't there more extreme cases where they found that like one particular Y chromosome sure. ended up yeah, in like a huge portion of like, uh, you know, yeah. Pakistan or some area like that? Yeah, there's, there's, yeah, there's, a, there's a lot of places of, of, of replacement as well. But um, those are not as historically important because by the time we have history, mm-hmm. um, populations are settled farming populations. Right. So most of the replacement has been hunter gatherers. So there's very little European Pleistocene hunter gatherer ancestry in modern Europeans. Okay. okay. Um, some listeners are going to who know this stuff are going to think that I'm wrong, uh, because there is a lot of hunter gatherer like ancestry in modern Europeans, but that's because it's where they came from. They mixed, um, like say in Eastern Europe, uh, and so people routinely overestimate. They're like, oh, that's 20% hunter gatherer. That's a lot, but it's that's because the ethnogenesis of the Indo-European groups included a lot of hunter-gatherer, but the indigenous hunter-gatherers of Western Europe probably left very little impact from what geneticists who have looked closely at the data, data tell me, like say like a couple of percent. Mm-hmm. So uh, I have a question for you. So I'm Jewish, uh, Ashkenazi Jewish, um, it, well, only half Ashkenazi. Um, what is the genetic- Wait, which half? Which half? Uh, my father's side. So you're not really Jewish. Right. <laughs> you know what I'm saying. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I say it. Um, so my my father's side is uh, Jewish. They're Russian Jews, or they're, they're actually from Estonia, but I think we're Russian in origin. Um, and uh, when when they, I don't know, I literally know nothing about genetics, so I, I apologize for being totally ignorant on this topic. Um. But when when they look at like uh, the history of Ashkenazi Jews, how much intermixing is it? Is, is there um, among like the non-Jewish population or within Jews that have non-Jewish lineage? And um, and also, by the way, I'm going to be butchering language, so you know, apologize for that too. No worries, I do that. Um, and like, did did the Ashkenazi did the Ashkenazim like come from uh the middle east has that been traced back what do you know about jewish history yeah there's a lot there's a lot um that's that's out there so i can like tell you like pretty definitively um about 40 to 50 percent of the ancestry of modern ashkenazi jews Mm -hmm. um, derives from the middle east um probably a population more like assyrian christians or armenians um there's been some migration since the ashkenaz those like and there tended to be male um Mm -hmm. those men left and so when you look at modern Middle Eastern populations and compare them with Europeans, you say, what's the percentage? You get a lower percentage. But that's because those weren't the ancestors. The ancestors are more like Armenians or Assyrian Christians before the Arab migrations, you know, reduce some of the relatedness. So what's the rest? Um, most of the rest is very similar to, say, northern Italian. 
um, it looks like these men, because um, the, the Y chromosomes are much more Middle Eastern, intermarried uh, with um, Gentile women in the Western Roman Empire, uh, mostly in the Mediterranean region. And so, you know, let's say like 30 to 40 percent um, is from these, you know, Southern European, Southwestern European women. Um, looking more and more closely at it, it does look like some, there is some Northern European admixture into Ashkenazis, um, probably closer to 10% than 20%, so not that much, but it looks like it could be German or Slavic, which is not entirely shocking. And yeah. so um, the ethnogenesis occurs through Middle Eastern men um, moving to the Western Roman Empire and intermarrying with Gentile women, producing these Italian Jewish communities. Well, that's why that's Jew why so many Jews look Italian. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and so they moved north, obviously into Rhines and um, the Rhine Valley, and eventually percolated by the medieval period into um, Poland, Lithuania, and that's where they intermixed a little bit more with Slavs and Germans, but not too much. So that's the smallest component. Uh, and then what happened there is this community just kept mixing with itself and not with the Gentiles and not with other Jewish communities. So Ashkenazi Jews have like very common ancestors, um, the same common ancestors 500 years ago, 500 to 750 years ago. It's like that's why they're genetically very similar, even though I mean they're not technically inbred. That's not true because it's just they had a, a limited population pool and then they underwent massive expansion within yeah. Poland, Lithuania. Right. Their reproductive rate was really high. OK, so. um Oh, what directions do I want to go in this? I have a question about whiteness. Can I ask you? Yeah, I mean, it's you gonna, are. It's, it's going to be a really, really dumb question. So I'm just okay. letting you know. Because I think I've actually talked to you about this before. Or at least I know I know your position on this somewhat uh, from Twitter. But uh, how, how, did, how did the Jews then become white, one? And two, like how, how long did that process take? Like how... Um, how how long would they have had to uh, and this goes not just for Jews but any population that migrated into um, Western Europe like how how long would it have taken for the skin pigmentation to adjust uh, mm -hmm. that's kind of a dumb I'm realizing yeah, it's a no, dumb no, question I, but it, 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 it wouldn't necessarily take that long um, you know what like, I'm saying yeah yeah maybe 500 years max um, depending on the selection coefficient so if you look at the donor populations Ashkenazi Jews are actually paler than they should be. Yeah, um, really white. Frequency of frequency of blue eyes is higher than in Italians and definitely in the Middle Eastern source populations. Now, right. obviously, the 10 to 20 percent that's German and Slavic would be different. So you can imagine that um, those those alleles, those genetic variants tend to come from these northern European donor populations, which is the minority of the ancestry. But if there's a selection selection driving an increase in those alleles, um, that can mean that like, oh, well, 50 percent of the eye color genes, you know, eye color genetic variants are from the Slavic ancestors, even though genome wide is closer to 10 percent. Right. And so they're introducing new variants that could be useful in northern Europe. Yeah. Is there a, a connection there to Iranians with the blue eyes thing? Um, that the the blue eye, um, it's called OCA2 HERC2. It's a genetic locus that that's very um, wide. Well, that variant is ancient and it seems to be present in low frequency across much of Western Eurasia. Mm. But the highest frequency historically um, was in European hunter gatherers uh, before the arrival of farmers. So um, they were like 80 to 80 to 90 percent blue eyed. Holy crap. Uh, these, but um, they were also very dark skinned, probably and dark haired. So they didn't mm. look like anyone you would see around today. Um, and so these yeah. are probably the people that the farmers from the Middle East contacted or encountered six to you know eight thousand years ago in Europe. Okay. Um, so moving on then to I guess uh, I want to I want to touch a little bit on politics since this is a, a political podcast. Um, one of the phrases that you hear a lot, especially in the kind of circles that um, at least that I'm in, I, I won't say for you, but um, for me at least, you hear. Uh, a lot of complaining uh, on the right about issues like, uh, and by the way, I'm, I don't consider myself on the right. These are just sort of the people that I end up interacting with a lot on Twitter. Um, you see a lot of complaints about uh, like demographic transitions and, um, you know, you see the phrase demographics or destiny a lot. Um, and there's a sort of belief that uh, if the demographic composition of the nation changes uh, too much, then it will sort of lock in a certain set of um, 
attendant like political objectives that would then be very difficult to remove. Um, how much do does genetics play a role in people's political attitudes? And do you think that demographics are destiny in that sense? Yeah, I mean, there's I, the, in answer to your question, no, partly because there's just too many sequences of steps from the mm -hmm. genetic level. Yeah, it's just too, too. Yeah, distant. but um, I mean, in a trivial sense, yes, because I'm a materialist and blah, blah, blah. But that doesn't mean that you can predict anything from it. You know what I'm saying? Sure. Um, so uh, politics is somewhat heritable because personality is heritable. Mm -hmm. um, low level of heritability or not low, but moderate, say 30 to 40 percent. Um, and so, um, you know, I could imagine some interpopulation differences, but it's hard to understand. It's hard to think about, like, how that might play out, because, you know, historically, um, women, because they're more religious in the 20th century, tend to be actually more favorable towards right wing parties. But here in the United States, we think it's the opposite, you know, and so that's obviously a historically contingent um, development. You know? Yeah. So, yeah, I think I'd say it's probably more like like technologically mediated and also just the, the, the rise in secularism. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah, you know, in all the Western countries, I think the women are tend to be more liberal than the men. Well, I mean, it depends on what you're talking about, though. They're still more religious. Yeah, on aggregate, I guess. And they're more, they're, I mean, they're, they're more, I mean, they're more liberal on economic issues, but on social issues, it's touch and go, right? They're more liberal on gay rights, but they're more conservative on porn mm -hmm. and uh, what they call sex work now. So, um, I, I would kind, I kind of like disagree with the generalization they are more liberal um, they tend to vote for more liberal parties but that's a different thing and that's yeah. a more recent thing right they used to vote for conservative parties as late as the 1980s in much of europe because they were because the left parties were anti-clerical right mm. so it's, it's been in the united states we never had a clerical party so religion right. was never as big of a deal right and in fact there was no social issue difference between the republicans and democrats until the 1980s mm -hmm. right well if so, so that's data. that's a good answer then because I, I was I was never really bought into that argument that if you just bring certain I mean usually it's certain colors of people uh, over that that's automatically going to mean that like uh, you know democratic policies or like pro-immigration policies are going to become the norm forever. Um, yeah, you know, I, I think that cultural attitudes change over even just one generation. And um, obviously, one of the things that we're seeing right now is like a lot of the right is actually trying to is 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 capturing a large percentage of um, of the uh, Latino Latino vote. Um, and I, I expect that to continue because they're more religious than, um, you know, than the white population. Um, mm -hmm. So, I, well, yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, you know, I, I have a lot of friends in immigration restrictionism, mm -hmm. um, you know. I know people at CIS and other places like that. And I, you know, I write for National Review periodically. I'm not like out of sympathy with it. In fact, that I probably leaned in that direction because I think we need to be careful about um, cultural change. The main issue that I have, though, is um, the deterministic element just doesn't make sense. Like it never seems to, it, cultures are not frozen and people are not frozen. Um, I'm much more open to open immigration right now because I think our current elites are corrupt and perverted, like literally but, perverted. But aren't you know? they? Aren't they just bringing in like they just want to bring in people with, um, you know, with like work visas. Right. So if you're just bringing in like high, basically high and like very high, 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 high end labor and, and low end labor is basically how it how it dichotomizes. Um, I mean, those, in terms those, those of like, are, yeah, those are the labor with portable skills, too. Yeah. In terms like of if, like if, if you're an insurance, the if you're an insurance agent, if you're an insurance salesman, which yeah. is the middle class job. Um, that would be hard for an immigrant to do because they don't have the tacit community connections, you know, but if you're a software engineer, whatever, right. Or if you're a janitor, whatever. So I think that's one of the things, um, in, in terms of the culture and democracy and voting. Yeah. I mean, it's, of course it's going to have an effect, but, um, you know, I can give you historical examples. Like the French secularists were really worried about Polish and Italian migration in the 19th century because they were Catholic, they were religious, they were going to support the right wing parties. Mm. Didn't matter. They became secular, you know, right. I'm not saying that's going to happen. I'm just saying that it's very difficult to predict these things. And so I think it's OK to be worried. Yeah. But demography is not destiny because you can't predict the future. Yeah. So it's just it's strange to me that you are pro immigration because you think the elites are so perverted, because I think that the, the reason they're pushing immigration is to do wealth transfers for themselves, mostly. Yeah, sure. That's fine. That's not that's not my that's not my concern. I think mm -hmm. the elites are perverted because, uh, you know, I believe in nuclear family, bourgeois values, sure. and they don't believe that anymore. 
So oh, I would rather I like live a run like I would rather. So I have, you know, like some of my readers were angry. They're like, oh, do you want us to turn into Brazil? And I'm like, well, they elected Bolsonaro. I mean, what are you trying to say? I mean, you're making the argument for me now. You know, well, I'm not I'm not happy about the Brazil. I'm not talking about America, you specific. But... I'm not talking about you specifically. I'm just saying if you're a socially conservative person, mm -hmm. why wouldn't you want mass immigration from socially conservative countries? Because like what we have today in the United States, we don't have socially conservative elites. Jerry right. Falwell, there are none. Jerry Falwell Jr., Mr. In the Corner guy, is your socially conservative elite. They're all perverted, right? They're yeah. all they're all debased. And so um, if we're gonna if we're gonna bring in a new people with like new mores and new values, maybe that's better. I mean, I didn't I wouldn't have said that ten years ago because I still had faith in the system. Mm -hmm. I don't have any faith in the system. I know people who work in Senate offices and stuff like that. The Republicans, they care about their taxes. Um, you know, they care about these oligarchs. I mean, they say they don't, but they only do things for the oligarchs. So what's the yeah. point of having that party and yeah, having I, a socially conservative party? You know? I agree. I think I think both the parties are not really on the side of um, everyday people in general. But um, so one question that I thought would be interesting to ask you, just because uh, you're the first Indian I've had on my show. Congratulations. Um, we're fulfilling our diversity. Oh, requirement. I, I was born in Bangladesh. Just want to make clear oh, sorry. I'm not technically Indian. But it's the same I, difference. I, I don't care. Yeah, I know I'm, you're Bangladeshi. I'm not, not that was I, don't a slip want, I just don't want I just don't want your um, your white listeners to be offended by your your mis misnationing me or my Indian listeners. There are listeners yeah. in India. Yeah, they're probably sure. be more butthurt <laughs> that you're claiming Bengali. Um, uh, no, 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 do you so think that are, Indians have a special there are place? Bengalis, to... There are Bengalis in India and Bengalis in Bangladesh, just to be yeah. clear. India yeah, is yeah. multinational, right? So. Right. So do you think that people like yourself? <laughs> I'll just say that have a special role to play in the future of the United States, uh, in particular with respect to race relations. Because one of the things that I'm seeing a lot, and, and people talk about this all the time in Silicon Valley, is um, that they will promote South Asians to high positions to you know run your company or whatever, because it basically gets a lot of the woke people off your back. Um, what's, what's your take on that? And who and, says, like, who whole, says that? Well, I've just heard it said about like um, the CEO of Microsoft, and yeah. uh, you know that's 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 one of the dumbest things I've heard. I mean, that does that like if you know people in Silicon Valley, that's not what's happening there because the Asians are don't count. Do you understand? Well, so so the they East don't Asians, right? No, they, South Asians don't count either. Like this is that's like oh, seriously, like sometimes when people talk about what's happening in Silicon Valley, it's like they don't know people in Silicon Valley. Well, they probably right? don't. I mean, it's like they just so they're just like making shit up. That's just no, I've never like I know people in Silicon Valley and uh, that has nothing to do with mm -hmm. it. Um, it has to do with the fact that Indians are aggressive and they have good social skills sure. and uh, they have sharp elbows. Um, Indian Americans, you know what I'm saying? Or whatever. They're, those, those guys are born in India. But I mean, the problem with the East Asians is they don't have sharp elbows, you know? Um, oh, so you think it's like a cultural difference? Well, I mean, dude, there's been social science on it. Again, oh, yeah, like, I, people I know need this. to actually like look at it. Like, you can look at like regressions, and you see Indians are way outperforming East Asians when it comes to management. But they start same on the technical level. Okay. Right? Do you think they're higher verbal than um, perhaps? Yes, than the East that's, Asians? that's that's probably the. I mean, I don't think it's necessarily the verbal IQ. I think it's the ability to talk. So I know for a fact that the Chinese government is worried and annoyed by this fact because they want more Chinese CEOs. And right, they want more many. Chinese leadership. Yes, exactly. You know, and so they don't understand what's going on. The hypothesis from the Valley people I know is it has to do with personality, aggression. Maybe it's um, what Chinese rumor. Maybe they've just planted it. What what, what do you what, what's the Chinese rumor? The 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 claim that they're promoting these Indian CEOs to like get the diversity schools off their backs. No, I mean, like I've heard like so I, I hear people saying like, oh, well, the Indians are like they create this like ethnic nepotism stuff I, again. Like that, that's I don't one believe of the in that. I, I work for well, Indians Indian, and I don't see any of that. Well, the issue is Indians are very, very, let's say, diverse. So there is yeah. they're not like Ashkenazi Jews. They don't have like they don't speak the same language. They're different religions. Huge place. They, you know. <laughs> yeah. So it's like that's a dumb thing to say. And then as far as like the woke points, no, that unfortunately that doesn't work. Mm -hmm. I mean, I wish it would in a way but um that's not that's not what it is because like i mean these are like foreign immigrants they're not uh, the woke perspective on like what is marginalized is very very narrow and uh so you're yeah, not gonna well, get out of your heart you know 
people complain about on Twitter, at least about, um, you know, like pro like, uh, Indians who come from a high caste in their own society coming to the United States and then playing up the, you know, I'm a, I'm a poor immigrant, you know, look at me, I'm a brown person kind of thing. Sure. Uh, yeah. It's, it's, it's the flight to victimhood, which is universal and they're very good at it. Unfortunately, I call it out to, um, there are no Indians who come from low caste in the United States that I know of. Like I've met like, Oh really? I've heard rumors. Wow. I've heard I didn't, that, even, I've heard I didn't that know it was that extreme, some, but I've never met. One. Yeah. Yeah. There's like, like 25% of in Yeah. I heard I, a friend told me that he knew someone who was Dalit. Mm. That's the, I've never met anyone like that. Okay. Like it, everyone's like privileged. So it's all BS when they're talking about, um, I saw, so I, I'll give you a concrete example. Um, I saw somebody about like tweeting about oppression and trauma. The woman, I know someone who went to grad school with her. She comes from a wealthy family. They paid her graduate school tuition. So she didn't have to TA and she comes from a Brahmin family. And so she's just lying. Yeah. Maybe she's telling, she's thinking she's telling herself the truth, but most people that are white have no idea. And so they just buy it, you know, but all Indians immediately know they're like, okay, your name is a Brahmin name. You had people like carrying your poop out of your house. You know, yeah. there's like a so whole cast. That must cast be disgusting when you see that. I mean, it's annoying. Um, and uh, I, I mean, uh, one of the reasons people dislike me is like, I will call that stuff out. Yeah. You know, it's, it's like, it's like really, really, um, I heard of, this is a similar case. I heard of a, there's a journalist in DC who's uh, from a black African immigrant background. His parents are Africans and mm. he's, he had a driver. But um, he acts like, you know, he talks about white supremacy all the time. But he has he had a driver in college. Yeah. So yeah. that sort of stuff is like, that's common. Um, you know, these right. systems and games are, are easy for elites to take over and just co-opt. It's not the genuinely oppressed poor people that are speaking for these classes. It's always, you know, and sometimes um, I feel like, you know, legitimate oppressed people then start to overreact and it's complicated because there's really no fidelity to the truth. It's all who whom power games. You know what I'm saying? And that's the sad thing about America. There's no values. There's no virtue. That's what I'm saying. When I, when I say the elites are perverted, right. um, we have elites that don't believe in any virtue except their own power, their own self-aggrandizement. And this is true on the left and the right, unfortunately. Um, there's, I, I don't see any unfortunately good options. So I'm very, I'm very uh, pessimistic about that. I hope I'm wrong. Um, but, um, the last couple of years have been giving us a lot of empirical data and none of it is making me more optimistic. Yeah. So I've been reading the, uh, the, uh, biography of Benjamin Franklin lately. And, um, one of the interesting things to me about, uh, just Ben Franklin as an individual it w was this. This uh, public spiritedness and this sociality that he had, where he really felt an obligation in, in terms of what he did for the country, uh, to, you know, ensure the future of uh, of generations was better than than his own, and to set up, you know, institutions and 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 social organizations for the like the just the betterment of the public. And he was already a wealthy man for most of his life. So he didn't really need to be doing these things, but these are things that he, you know, really felt, uh, should be cultivated and is part of like being a good citizen. And I feel like that is a little bit of what you're talking about has been lost on our elites. Do you think that has to do with the secularization or do you think it's, um, just sort of something that happens when a, uh, uh, society yeah. becomes too decadent? I think it's the latter. Um, secularization, I mean, elites have gone through multiple waves in the United States. Remember, like, we didn't have a Christian, a conventionally Christian president of the United States until Andrew Jackson. Mm -hmm. All of the early ones were very heterodox, either like deists or like, you know, only marginally Christian. They were culturally Christian, but that's a different issue, right? Yes. And so, um, you know, and, you know, so I don't think it's religion as such, but it's more values, which religion is closely associated with historically in the West. But, um, you know, people were educated in a certain way. They had exemplars of, of, you know, public service. And, you know, I mean, in ancient Rome, the elite families, they competed to do public service to get glory for their family. Like that was what they want here in the United States. What do we want? We want like a big, big yacht, you know, yeah, we want like uh, our we third want, house. Like, that sort of stuff. And it's just like, that's fine. But, um, I think we're at the end of the line of that because um, there's no there's no argument you can make to an elite where it's like, you know, they want their next 10 billion. 
okay, what? You know, I mean, like, what is that doing for you? But it's like we've confused money, which is a, a measure, it's a signal of some success with success. Okay. Um, yes, I mean, there's a big, di- there's a difference if you like are worth a hundred million versus a million, but at a certain point, it doesn't really matter, right? Yeah. Like, and so, like, what's going on? The scoreboard. But, yeah, he's running up the scoreboard. So, I mean, I think like, that's that's the thing that I I believe is happening. And then with our politicians, they rub shoulders with these people. So, you know, that's what they're doing. They're they're um, setting themselves up for their future lobbying career, and um, you know, like I've. I've asked around people who work in Senate offices of Republican senators, like what's going on with like all this um, left wing agitation. And basically they're like, the senators like, oh, we can't really do anything about it. So we're going to focus on tax policy. And if that's, what's going to happen, um, you know, let's, it's not a sustainable ta- status quo. Like it's not a sustainable status quo. Like um, people cannot um, have all this like conflict in the culture and be happy um or productive yeah (laughs) yeah i mean i i think that a lot of the all this culture war stuff is is an existential threat to the future of the united states in terms of um having a functioning anything political system i agree state capacity anything um It's, it's burning through social capital yeah and it's also just yeah it's burning through social capital and um it's just it's also just a huge distraction. Like there's only so much attention that people have, right? So um, if we're, if every single institution and every single organization just gets infiltrated with this stuff and then it's all meetings about who said what and, you know, going over the new rules and blah, 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 blah. Well, then you're actually not doing real work. You know, you're not um, building things. You're not discovering things. You're not actually getting anything done. And that's really ideal if you're uh, an enemy of the United States. What's that mean? It's decadence, you know. It's what it's what you were asking. We're decadent, unfortunately. Yeah. So, uh, in terms of like the evolution of, you said you focus on evolution a lot, right? Do you uh, do you focus on? Do, do you think of like the evolution of? Um, are, are you focusing on just pure evolution in the biological sense, or are you also uh, interested in like the evolution of like systems and? Um, yeah, I'm, I'm a big cultures. cultural evolution guy. I'm okay. a big cultural evolution guy. I actually um have a. Um, I did a podcast with Joe Henrik mm-hmm. um, with his new book, Weirdest People in the World. And yeah, I'm excited you know, to hear um, that. I'm I'm pretty um I'm pretty uh so I mean it's it's live now, by the way, if you're subscribed. Yeah, I know. But um I just didn't so get to it. I, I've um I know a lot of the cultural evolution people personally. Uh so mm-hmm. yeah, I know Peter Turchin, I know Joe now. Um, you know, I used you know to Peter. when I was at UC Yeah. And when I used to sit in uh, yeah, I like I you know, I've had drinks with Peter, like we're you know like IRL buddies. Uh, when I was at Davis, I used to sit in on a human behavior and evolution group. Um, so, you know, I'm a pop- I'm an interesting population geneticist and genomics guy in terms of like I have a deep interest in cultural evolution and evolutionary theory in general, um, and how it can allow us to understand human history, human dynamics. Um, and I think that they have a lot to say. Um, and I think um, you know, it's going to be a news you can use type of field. Uh, I'm not sure if it's going to be you know, approximately useful enough to make policy decisions right now, but it can give us what the next generation, you know? Um, so like stuff about structural demographic analysis, which, you know, obviously historians and economic historians have looked at before, but I think evolution brings a new angle to it. Um, you know, Peter's correct predictions are partly just due to the fact that, you know, he's um, very aware of nonlinear developments, which mm-hmm. is an unfortunate problem where I feel like everyone's just straight line projecting. So you always have to be... Um, you know, think like Nassim Taleb, like he says some of the same things where there's like these tail risks and black swans, white swans, and there's volatility in systems. And I think cultural evolution really makes that clear. And so when, again, when people are saying, well, you know, demography is destiny. I mean, I don't necessarily disagree with that, but cultural evolution tells us that things can take really nonlinear turns. And so everything that you predict might not, you know, turn out the way that you think it would turn out. So for example, um, 1965 Immigration Act, yeah, it got rid of a lot of the quotas, but it was originally um, family-based because they assumed that that would preserve the white bias, you know, the European's dominant stream. That was mm-hmm. the intent um, because, you know, there'd be a lot of Irish people already in this country. And a lot, I mean, most of the immigrants were European, so who's going to bring the families over? Europeans. Right. So that's they why didn't. they had the whole tag, tag team system. 
Yeah, but they didn't. But they didn't anticipate that the European immigration stream would decline so much that it would get overwhelmed, right? So, um, I, I think people just need to be careful about being cocky about what you know. And I'm older, so that's partly why. Because I was like, I remember what people were saying in 2003 before we went into Iraq, and people didn't know anything, but they acted like they did, you know. Mm-hmm. And so that's, I think, getting older. You realize that. Yeah, I'm having an Iraqi uh, refugee on the show on Friday, actually. Nice. Hey, so that'd be interesting. Yeah, I'm gonna get yeah, some I'm subscribed of it. now, so I'll probably hear that. Sick, sick, awesome. Um, do you want to talk about China and India a little bit? Yeah, um, I gotta get a jet after that, but let me um. Sure. So basically, it's interesting. Like I, you know, I was an optimist. I was hopeful that China is a civilized state, but um, in terms of China and India right now, they're like two different, two different systems, right? And it's exactly what you see on the surface, like a centralized, homogenous culture um, that's frankly, really authoritarian. And then India is just this chaotic place with a lot of different ideas. Um, right now, Hindu nationalism is hegemonic, but who knows if it will be. Um, the economy is decreasing by 24% this year so far. That's a lot. Uh, Modi's lockdown strategy didn't work. In fact, it seems like it was a disaster. Um, and so we'll see. Um, in the short term, China's like leaving India in the dust. Um, but there is the demographic aspect where... India's population is going to increase. Its working age population is going to increase, and China's is declining. So I think um, for the next generation, there is really no comparison. India is an also ran that needs to make alliances with the United States, probably. Um, but after 2050, who knows um, how long a geriatric China can kind of hold the reins as the dominant hyperpower of Asia? Wow. So your your take on China is actually more pessimistic. Uh, than mine is. In the short term, I'm pes- I'm optimistic. In the short mm-hmm. term, I think that just the numbers. The main issue with China, though, is in the long term, is like you cannot have a society where everyone, because like even though they got rid of the one child policy, a lot of middle class people continue having one child because that's the norm now. Right. You, so you can't you can't you can't have an inverted population pyramid and mm-hmm. like be a, a vigorous society. So do you think that'll be like a that'll be like a seventy year like lagging indicator right in terms of the functioning of that society it's going to take like a few generations yeah so two like say 50 okay i mean even now though you know it's working china's working age population peaked like five years ago wow so it's been declining don't they have like a millions and millions of men who just are never going to get married yeah, that hasn't caused too much problems just because those are marginalized individuals anyways. Um, and also a lot so of those sort of men die. are now, Well, they're also bringing in women from Vietnam and other places. Okay, but they can't so be bringing having, in that many. Uh, it's, I mean, it, yeah, they're bringing in enough, you know, mm-hmm. that it's caused issues in other countries, you know? Yeah. Um, and so I, I don't think that's the primary issue. I think the primary issue is like, you know, if you know Chinese people, um, there are people who are millennials who now have four grandparents and two parents. And their parents are getting older and the grandparents are really old. And so, you know, in the next 10 to 20 years, they they and their partner, their husband or whatever wife are going to be the sole people responsible for all these old people. You like know? eight people. Yeah. And so like, that that puts that puts pressure on their ability to have children. So there's just like a demographic issue that they're and they know they're conscious. They're trying to deal with it. Um, but I, I think that the vigor and the, the strength of their society has a term limit because of that demographic inertia, which can change eventually. But there's inertia, right? Some of it is baked into the cake now. Yeah. So last question here uh, before I let you go, Razib, because I know you gotta you gotta head out soon. Um, this like skirmishing that they're doing at the border. Uh, I saw news about it today. They're they're doing more of it. Uh, you know, the Indian troops and Chinese troops sort of just firing at each other and bothering each other um is that like serious on a on a on a geopolitical level or is this just sort of like an ongoing thing where you know they've been at each other's border for centuries and they just sort of you know throw stuff across from time to time well it's not centuries because remember that um the chinese state as we understand it oh is i guess it expanded of the the late man the the late manchu right mm-hmm. so they added tibet and stuff like that but it's been decades um so I, when i talk to indian friends basically they tell me this is just a matter of course of skirmishes um and there were a lot of 
disputes with the border drawing in the early 20th century. And if you look at the history, the Chinese aren't, the Chinese are not totally um, in the wrong in some of these issues, actually. They're trivial. It's like a glacier, you know, but whatever, national pride. So basically the British drew the border and the Chinese kind of like agreed on certain things, but there wasn't like total agreement. And this is before satellites. This is before, you know, modern cartography. So mm -hmm. there's going to be disputes. And um, China just has like a weird attitude about its border because of the, you know, history of the 19th and early 20th centuries. And, you know, India is like, they're not going to like step back because they got their national pride. But I don't think that they'll they'll take it to full war. I think there's too much at stake. But um, I think they're going to do this shadow boxing probably for decades because why not? I mean, these are huge countries and, you know, 10 soldiers dying here and there doesn't make a big difference. I think. I mean, that's not it does make a difference in some ways. It's not good. But I think in the grand scheme, it's not a big deal for them. But, but but I'm asking though, like, what are they doing when they're doing that? Like, uh, they're not going to retake that glacier, right? And like, no, but they're draw the map. They're, they're showing they're showing that they're not going to be pushed around. Okay, so this, so this is, is all this about is, show of force for China. Like, we're, I think it's a zero sum game. Yeah, okay. I think it's a zero sum game where ideally they should just both agree not to do anything. But you know, like in game theory, it's like if one person you're worried that the other person will move first. So you yeah. move, you know, I think that's what's going on. I don't think they're not, they don't want a war and they know that this stuff is worthless, but they don't want the rest of the world seeing that this other big country can push them around. And so they don't want to do anything, but maybe they're going to push first because pushing first is always an advantage, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah, so I think, I think they're stuck in this sort of like a suboptimal equilibrium. Um, you know, Pakistan and India have the same issue. Pakistan wastes all its money on military, even though there's no way it can compete with a nation 10 times its size, you know, yeah. 10 times wealthier, but it still does it because they got their pride, but now they're, they're poor. You know, Pakistan is doing worse than Bangladesh now. No, I mean, I mean Bangladesh, yeah, Bangladesh is just like, take it, like just like surpassed it partly just because Bangladesh doesn't spend all its money on military. It focuses on economics. So Pakistan is like basically staying poor because of its pride. So I think unfortunately nations are not rational actors because humans are not rational actors. And in democratic systems, you see this sort of irrationality playing out. Cool. Well, uh, thanks so much Razib. I really appreciate you coming on. Um, go check out, uh, his new podcast and, uh, also his blog at gnxp.com. And you can find uh, Razib on Twitter at uh, Razib Khan. Thanks, man. Thanks. See ya.